Yeah, let's pray. Lord, thank you for this night, God. Thank you that uh, we don't have to worry about coming here being persecuted, Lord, that we have the freedom to uh, just listen to your word, God, and just hear the truth, Father, and let it fill us and uh, that we live it practically, Lord. I pray that you'd bless the message tonight. Bless Josiah, Father. Uh, bless the fellowship, God. I pray that you'd bless this night in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Max. I love when I see God working in your guys' lives, and it's fun to hear the stories of what God's doing in a lot of you. So um, I am here to talk about marriage and to talk about sex tonight. I hope you guys knew what you were in for. I tried to announce it this afternoon or this morning. Um, if not, it's not going to be too bad. Don't worry. I'm not going to make anybody hopefully feel too awkward. Um, we're not going to be weird about it. I just want to make sure that we as a group know what the Bible says, especially what Jesus says about marriage, about sex, about romance, about divorce. He gets into it all in these verses. Uh, so I've been feeling the awkwardness, uh, not awkwardness, but like actually not, not awkwardness at all, but the gravity of talking about this because I know that we're a whole bunch of different people with a whole bunch of different backgrounds. And this this topic in particular is vulnerable, right? Really, by nature, it's supposed to actually be vulnerable and intimate, um, but it makes it one that's just a little bit tougher to talk about without bringing up uh, a lot of emotions in some people. So I'm trying to be very aware of that, um, and I'm trusting the Holy Spirit's gentleness to flow through me as we talk about this tonight. I want to talk about it because our whole series that we've been going through is talking about how does following Jesus impact my life? That's, that's the basics of it. He says, take up your cross daily and follow me. So that daily part of like the moment by moment following Jesus, how's that gonna impact my career? We talked about that a few weeks ago. How's that impact when I get into conflict with somebody? That's what Nikki talked about last week. How does that impact my money and my financial situation? That's what Mark Philip is gonna preach on next week. Tonight, how does that impact how I think about marriage, how I think about sex, how I think about romance and dating and all that? Is Jesus even relevant to that part of my life? I'm gonna say a resounding yes to that question. He is, his, he is very relevant and he's got something to say about it. And it's really beautiful. I don't want you to miss how beautiful his picture of this is, even if it causes us to feel all sorts of weird feelings when we talk about it. Let me remind you from two weeks ago, the text that we talked about from Matthew 11, 28 through 30. This has one, become one of my favorite verses. God brought it up to my mind earlier this week just to comfort me at one point this week, and I was so grateful. I was like, oh yeah, you did say that. You'll bring me rest. Um, he says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. Remember that word soul means your whole life, your mind, your body, your will, your emotions, your relational life, including your sexuality. You will find rest, replenishment, abundant life if you learn from me. So going to Jesus, following his way, is the way to living a life of rest. Learning from Jesus, if we learn from Jesus, he will teach us how to live that abundant life that just flows from a place of restfulness and a place of rejuvenation and a place of joy. I am so convinced, based on experience, I am not living the perfect Christian life. <laughs> um, I, I won't this side of heaven, but I've been pretty committed, very committed to my decision to follow Jesus for several years now, lots of years now. And the only reason I say that is because I've tasted what I'm telling you guys. I've seen what I'm telling you guys, that the more I learn to align with the teachings of Jesus, the more I begin to live out of this place of rest, this place of joy, this place of peace. My relationships become more and more at peace the more I follow Jesus. My life, my inner life, my, my sense of joy, my sense of um, gratitude, 
all begin to align more and more to this um, peace that Jesus promises. And so I want you to remember that as we enter into this conversation that could be sticky for some people, I want you to hold this in your, the back of your mind the whole time, this truth that following Jesus is the path to abundant life. Following what Jesus says about how to live is the path to life. He says, I'm the way and the truth and the life. If we learn from him, we will follow and we will find that abundant life. I promise. I'm so convinced of that. I've given my life to it and I'm reaping the benefits of a life that not always at peace, but when I'm not at peace, I can find it in him. He's so good. Um, So, with all that said, if, if you're with me so far, let's, get, let's keep going. We're saying yes to that rest that he's offering. Okay, yeah, Jesus, I'm weary, I'm burdened, I want to find that rest. So we're saying yes to his invitation, and then we're saying yes to learning from him, because he said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. So we're saying yes to learning from him. So now, let's learn from him about what he says about marriage, and what he says about sex. Jesus dis- discusses this topic just a few times, and Interestingly, he doesn't ever really sit down in our recorded scripture and just say, here's my whole theology, here's my whole understanding of what marriage means, what sex means, how to date, what romance should look like. He never really sits down and teaches just on that topic. Um, But there is a time where he goes pretty deep into his theology on it. But what it is, it's in reaction or in response to a very specific question. So my task as a Bible teacher tonight is to dive into this passage where Jesus talks the most about, um, about this topic and unpack what he was saying within the context that he was saying, right? So we're not going to ignore the fact that this is in the middle of a debate between religious leaders as we talk about this. So all that said, it might take me a little longer than normal, and I know I, I talk a long time sometimes anyways, um, to unpack all the scripture, um, but I'm going to do my best to stay right on task and to um, do it with clarity, because I think it's really important to know what Jesus taught on this, and if it takes a little bit of unpacking to get there, I think it's worth it. I, I will pause and say that I got a lot of this message from a guy named Tim Mackey. He's the guy who does the Bible Project videos. Um, He's a professor. He's a scholar. Great guy. He taught a whole message on this passage, and so I'm stealing a lot from him. (laughs) Just so I'm not plagiarizing, I'm admitting I'm stealing a lot tonight from Tim Mackey. Um, You could actually, I could, if anybody's interested in learning more, I'll send you the link to the video I watched of him teaching on it. And then you'll realize, like, oh, yeah, Josiah stole a lot from Tim Mackey. But it's okay, because it's really good teaching. Let's look at what Jesus said in Matthew 11, no, Matthew 19, verses 1 through 12, I believe it is. This is what Jesus says when he's asked about divorce. It says, when Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went to the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. He did what he does. He brought healing to people. Then some Pharisees came to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? And then Jesus responded, haven't you read that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And the two will become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard, but it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. The disciples said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and wife, it's better not to marry. (laughs) And Jesus replied, not everyone can accept this word, only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who are born that way, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others, And there are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. 
All right, a lot of loaded topics all in one passage, and I'm going to try to tackle them all tonight. So some Pharisees, the first verse, some Pharisees came to test him, and they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? These Pharisees are the teachers of the law that end up eventually getting Jesus killed. They don't like him. He's causing this revolution. He's too countercultural. He, care, he loves the poor too much. He loves the sinners too much. He heals the wrong people. He pays attention to the wrong people, and he rebukes the Pharisees too much. So they don't like him. So they're trying to trap him. And they try to trap him with this question that doesn't sound like a trap to us, but it was a trap to them. It was a loaded question. There were these two camps, two rabbis, basically, that had a following that was very popular, and their teachings were very popular, that taught two different things about divorce. And it was like the big debate of the day. So it was kind of like somebody cornering Jesus and saying, hey, what do you think about critical race theory, right? And it's like, is that a trap? What, am I, what do I say to that? <laughs> you know? Or, hey, what do you think about gun control, Jesus? Right? Like, it's the topic of the day. That's the hot button issue that's going to make um, that somebody's got a political agenda on each side. And there's, everybody knows, oh, if he says this, it means he lines with this camp. And if he says this, he lines with this camp. So they're trying to do that. They're trying to put Jesus into a corner or into a camp and trying to figure out what he'd say about one of the most controversial topics. To understand the whole conversation, we have to go back to the Old Testament passages that are being referenced here. So in the Old Testament, there's 613 laws, I learned today from Tim Mackey, (laughs) Um, in the Old Testament, 613 laws. The first 10 are the Ten Commandments, and there's 603 more after that. Only two of those mention divorce. Out of all these laws, only two of them mention divorce. And so there's only two places that these people could have been debating about. One um, was from Exodus 21, 10 through 11, and the other one is from Deuteronomy. I want to look at both of them and unpack them just a little bit, and then we'll move on from there. But Exodus 21, 10 through 11, this is the first law in the Old Testament about divorce. And it says, if a man marries another woman, He must not deprive the first one of her food, clothing, and marital rights. If he does not provide for her with these three things, she is to go free without any payment of money. All right, so I just dug into another weird thing, polygamy, (laughs) a man having more than one wife. Um, And this is in the Old Testament law. And so one thing to remember when we get into Old Testament laws is to know, this might be news to you guys, that The Old Testament laws were not actually God's ideal morality. The reason is because Israel was a nation for quite a while before they were formed into God's people under the covenant of Moses. And during that time, before they were given the law on Mount Sinai and before they were formed into the nation of Israel where God was their God and they were his people, they were a nation among the pagan nation, Egypt, right? They were slaves to Egypt for a long time. And during that time, they had all the cultural influence of all the nations around them. And so they probably looked and acted and thought very much like the rest of the nations around them looked and acted and thought. They, they clearly worshipped the gods of Egypt um, because um, they kept falling back into that pattern over and over and over later. They clearly had a lot of thinking like that. So when God actually gave them the law on Mount Sinai, he was accommodating to them, um, to who they were, and making, in his grace, making a law that would make sense to them And it would set them apart from all the other nations, and it would move them towards holiness. But it was in a way that they could understand. This might be too deep for a few people, and that's okay. Um, Might be hard to understand some of this, but we can talk about it more later if you want to. But the basic idea is that the Old Testament laws like this, that kind of like still allow you to have more than one wife, we don't have to take that as God's ideal Morality. It was God working within an ancient and foreign culture to push people closer to his standards, um, but he didn't like make them like we understand life today. It wouldn't, it would have been like, we, it'd be presumptuous for us to even assume that he should have done that back then. He worked with the people as they were, and he moved them towards holiness, and he moved them towards justice. And we can actually see that in this passage. If you're thinking about this, 
this, I, this situation where you've got a man in a, in a patriarchal society. The man is the one who gets all the money, who gets all the inheritance, and is supposed to provide for his family. And so actually what this law is saying is in that setup that you guys have and understand, within that system, if there's a man who's not providing for one of his many wives... Um, she's allowed to go leave and find a husband that will take care of her. And so for her, this was like matter of life and death, matter of having food on the table, a matter of being able to be taken care of, and having sex is part of this command. Um, uh, marital rights just means, it means sex, and it's pretty explicit in the Hebrew. The English translations often make things a lot softer, but marital rights means sex. Um, so that's all included in this. Um, if a husband is not providing this for his wife, she can leave and go find a husband that will. And so really what God is doing in this passage is he's defending the rights of the weak, right? We see this so often in scripture. God looking out for the one who is being overlooked, who's being abused, who's being neglected, and making sure that they're taken care of. And so within this messed up system of polygamy, um, God is saying at least uh, make sure that the women have some protection. And so that's what this first divorce law is. Second divorce law, Deuteronomy 24 one through four. This one is, we won't even read the whole thing. Um, it's long and technical. It says, if a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house and after she leaves his house, she becomes wife of another man. Real technical and it goes on and on. Um, basically, it's another one that gives rights and protection to a woman who has been divorced. But the, this is where the debate comes in because what does it mean by a wife doing something that displeases him and finds something indecent about her? That's pretty vague, right? Like what does God mean in this law? And it was actually pretty vague in the Hebrew and it was pretty vague to the Pharisees. And so when you have a vague law that actually makes a big difference in your life, what do you do? You debate about it, right? And so you had one camp, the Shammai camp, that was um, strict about it. And they said, no, a husband can't divorce his wife for any reason. What it means to um, find something indecent about her is that she has committed sexual immorality. She's cheated on her husband. And in that situation, he can divorce her and all this stuff happens. Um, the other camp, the Hillel camp, this other rabbi named Hillel, um, was teaching that this meant anything displeasing. If she does anything that displeases her husband, if she doesn't cook the meal right, um, one, another rabbi even said if she becomes displeasing to his eyes, like she gets too old or something, like he can divorce her. So there were these two camps, one saying um, that the husband can only divorce for sexual immorality, the other camp saying the husband can leave, Moses told us the husband can leave as long, if she displeases him for any reason. That's the fight. That's the debate that's going on. That's why it's a loaded question when they come up to Jesus and say, hey Jesus, tell us this. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Are, we, are you Hillel? Or are you Shammai? Or are you something different? And what Jesus does is he does not engage in the debate right away. He doesn't pick a side and say, this side's better than that side. We can learn a lot from this, right? He doesn't just dive right into the heated debate and make, what he did, does is he goes back to the foundation that they were missing. They were missing the whole foundation, the proper understanding of what marriage even is. Because if you think about both sides of these camps and the whole understanding of the marriage institution based on the law, if you based it on either of these laws, what you get is that marriage is for the pleasure of a man, right? That's what you get if you only base it off of these two laws. And that's because God was accommodating to the hard hearts of Israel. Jesus says that real explicit in a minute. Um, so what you get is that marriage is for the pleasure of a man. And so if can the man divorce his wife because of this? Or can a man divorce his wife because of this? And Jesus says, wrong and wrong because your foundation is wrong. And so what Jesus does is he takes us all the way back to Genesis, the first couple pages of the Bible, Genesis chapter one and Genesis chapter, chapter two. And he says, let me teach you something about what marriage is actually about. 
because your whole mindset that the whole institution of marriage is for the pleasure of a man is wrong. It's off base. He says, pretty snarky to say to a Pharisee, he says, haven't you read? They had this thing memorized. They've read Genesis 1 and 2. I promise you, they have read and read and recited and recited Genesis 1 and 2 their whole lives probably. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So the Pharisees had been basing their assumptions on marriage based on the law, but that was the wrong place to start. Jesus goes back to Genesis 1, and I think we can learn from that strategy as well. So one thing he does when he's talking to the Pharisees that we need to notice, and it makes us do a little more homework, um, is that he often takes for granted that the Pharisees are actually going to know the whole passage, so he only quotes a little part of it. And so he actually quotes two very significant different passages within that little sentence that I just read. Um, And so we're going to go back and refresh our memories um, to know really what Jesus was tackling, which portions of scripture he was tackling when he defined what the marriage marriage institution is really about. So the first one that he quotes when he says, um, God, in the beginning, the creator made them male and female. He's quoting from a poem. The the whole thing's a poem, but there's a poem within a poem in Genesis chapter 1. where it talks about how God created humans. In Genesis 1.27, here's the beautiful little poem about why we exist, the purpose of life. It says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. That's this little poem about the creation of humanity. And it's, profound. I want to unpack a couple of things here. It says, God created mankind in his own image. Humanity. Not man, not woman, but humanity. God created in his image. And then that image has two parts, male and female. He created them. And then, um, and then it goes on and he, he told them to go fill the earth and multiply. So you have this picture of God Creating an image. Now, do you guys remember what the first commandment was? Anybody remember? It was like, don't make, don't worship any other God before me and don't make an image of God. Don't make any images of God. That was bad. That was what the other nations did. They made these little idols of their gods and worshiped that image. The same word is used in this poem. So no human was supposed to make any image of God because you cannot contain the concept of God in any image, no matter what kind of artist you are, you cannot create an image of God that's worth worshiping. But on the other hand, God has already created an image of himself. And that image of himself, biblically, is mankind. He created mankind in his image. And the purpose of creating mankind in his image was to show the world what what God looks like, a glimpse of what God looks like. And it's really interesting, the order of things here in this little poem in Genesis, where God created mankind, one entity, but then there were two parts, but then those two become one flesh again. And in becoming one flesh, they create a lot of other people, right? So God is one and created mankind as one, but then they have two parts that come together as one, and that creates a whole bunch more people. And kind of it's this idea that it it shows what love looks like in a way, right? Like love can't be contained to one. Love has to be shared with somebody else. And then when you share love, it becomes this intimate union, and then that intimate union just bursts out more Love, right? So we were all created uh, by love, for love, from love, right? Love is what we were created for. Uh, And this unity in marriage is an image of what love looks like. And so from the very beginning, God uh, created mankind in his image to share love 
with one another. And then he says, go be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So part of the function of humanity is this love that multiplies love. And it shows what God looks like when we do that. Um, I will say that right here, um, the, all the modern nuances of what gender means and all that isn't really part of this conversation here. Jesus isn't directly addressing that, but he is showing us the archetype of what he originally created. He created a male and he created a female, and it's in that unity um, that, that this love is shared throughout the world. All right, so that's the first, that was, our, that was just w- one little part of his sentence. For this reason, oh wait, no, so he, Jesus replied that the, in the beginning, the creator made them male and female. So that's what we just discussed. Um, that's the image of God, which is shared through love. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Anybody know where that's from? That one's from the next chapter, Genesis chapter 2. It's several verses down. You skip a lot in between. So Jesus is taking two important things that God said about humanity at the beginning and just mashing them together into one sentence. Um, but in doing that, he's saying all of it. <laughs> Does that make sense? Like he knows that they know the whole poem. They know the whole chapters. And they know from the beginning and the end all the stuff in between. And so um, he can take that for granted because he knows they have read it. Even though he said, haven't you read? He knows they have. And so in Genesis 2.24, let's go there. Um, Jesus says, this is why man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. This is something that I didn't really think a lot about until this week. And when I did, it was like, this is amazing. This concept, if God hadn't established it in the garden, we would look a lot more like animals than we do. (laughs) Like, this is a very interesting concept thing that Jesus did, or God did in the beginning. He, he said, you will leave your family of origin, and you're going to go find a wife or a husband, and you will be united to that one person forever for the rest of your life, and in that union, you'll multiply and create more humans, okay? So that, um, and the reason that was mind-blowing, I knew all that, <laughs> but the reason that was mind-blowing is because in the absence of that, would be what the rest of the animal kingdom does, right? (laughs) Like, we've all seen the Discovery Channel and had that thought like, wait, how do they have so many partners, right? Anybody ever thought that when they watched the Discovery Channel? (laughs) Why does God make the animal kingdom just run wild like that? Why don't they have more monogamous relationships in the animal kingdom? There are a few, which are interesting, um, but not very many. And um, humans would be just like that if we decided to just live based on our urges. Because we are, we have the same... testosterone that male animals have, right? And we are, there's something in us that drives uh, men especially to go find a lot of partners. That's just part of the nature, the urges that God created inside of us. And so what he's asking us to do when he gives us this command to leave your father and mother and become one flesh with one other person is a whole different paradigm than anything that's natural even inside of us. It's something that we have to obey. It's not something that we will naturally do. In the natural, we will go live like animals. In, if we obey God's command, we will do what he asks us to here. And the whole concept here is what introduces the concept of family to creation. Family wouldn't exist if everybody was going to multiply with everybody else. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that would, there'd be no sense of family. There'd be no sense of who my parents are. There'd be no sense of what home I grew up in. There'd be no sense of anybody nurturing and raising me past um, when I can f- fend for myself, right? And so the whole concept of family is, is invented here when God says a man will leave his father and mother, be united forever, their whole life, with somebody of the, uh, with his wife, and become one flesh. And then Jesus says, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So this is a bond that lasts for a lifetime. And it's, I'm, it made me so grateful as I thought about that this week, that our world doesn't look like the animal kingdom does, right? Like there have been a lot of cultures and a lot of societies that are built based on family, right? This concept of family that God established at creation. 
And I'm really glad for that. Now, obviously, there's brokenness, and family is the deepest source of pain in most of our lives. But um, the institution of family is something to be grateful for. And it's something that started here. And it's something that's only possible with this concept of marriage between a man and a woman for life, committed forever. Um, If you look at the Bible with that one flesh union, um, it's on multiple levels. The one flesh union happens, um, it says what God has joined together, let no one separate. So there's this spiritual unity that happens when somebody gets married. The bond is sexual, and that's actually chemical. (laughs) This isn't sex ed class. You guys know this, right? (laughs) That when you have sex, there's like chemicals released in both a man and a woman that are bonding chemicals that make you want to stay with that person and be with that person and be more intimate with that person for a long time. There's actually a chemical reaction built into this, which is awesome. So there's um, chemical and physical union, there is a spiritual union, what God has joined together, let no one separate, and there's a legal union. Like, the the, the idea of, um, we do it, like, by the state of Ohio, I give you, I pronounce you man and wife, Um, but the vows that we make go back to Old Testament covenants, and the Bible discusses um, marriage as a covenant. It's something, a covenant was a legally binding agreement, a verbal agreement between two people um, back in ancient Near East history. So they would make agreements based on uh, covenants that they would speak to each other, promises that they would make to each other, and those were legally binding. And so on multiple levels, this unity between a man and a woman for the rest of their life is binding. What God has joined together, let no one separate. Um, how are you guys doing so far? You with me? Am I rambling too much? Are we good? All right. Two more hours. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> um, I would like to say we're nearing the end. We'll see if that's true. Um, so I want you to, I want to think about this one more way. We've talked about healthy boundaries a few times here at um, young adults. When we talked about our friendship series, we talked about putting up healthy boundaries um, so that you're not hurt, right? Like oversharing with somebody that you don't really know very well um, can cause you pain if they turn their back and backstab you, right? Like if you share your whole life with somebody and then they go and tell somebody else, that hurts like crazy, right? And so you should learn some healthy boundaries so you don't become too intimate with somebody else that you don't trust, right? Well, God knows this. This is a concept that God is very aware of, and he actually built it in to what marriage is supposed to be. Sex is the most intimate and vulnerable thing you can do. And God knows it, and God made it that way, and he really actually doesn't want his kids to get hurt. And so he made it so that you're only supposed to have sex within the safety of a spiritual, physical, and legal bound relationship for the rest of your life so that you're only sharing that part of yourself with one person for the rest of your life so that you're not hurt. Like God is just so kind. (laughs) He made this whole institution so that we wouldn't be out there making ourselves vulnerable with people that we can't really trust. So when when, when we're having sex outside of the marriage commitment, covenant, spiritual binding, and physical binding, if we're having sex, the physical is happening, um, but the spiritual and the legal haven't. If we're having sex outside of marriage, we're, it's, it's, we're going beyond a healthy boundary that God has established for us out of his love and his concern for us. He doesn't want anybody to get that intimate and that vulnerable with somebody else without them paying the respect of saying, you're the only one for the rest of my life that I will commit myself to. It's beautiful. It's really beautiful. It's, I'm so grateful that God put up that boundary so that within that marriage, marriage bond, sex is beautiful. It's good. It's not easy and it's not uncomplicated and it's not like paradise all the time. You know, if you're not married yet, you'll learn that. Hopefully you learn that before you're married. Um, it doesn't make life just like bliss all the time, but it's good. And it really does bond a marriage together in a deep way. Um, but I don't want to see any of my friends be hurt by giving themselves to somebody who then turns their back on them eventually. I only want to see my friends and you guys giving themselves to somebody else within the safety of a marriage covenant. Um, 
I don't know if people are wanting to walk out on me saying stuff like that, but I'm, I'm really trying to be faithful to the scripture here and to honor God in the beauty of the arrangement that he's made. All right. Um, well, let's keep going through this little dialogue between Jesus and the Pharisees. So they try to like get back at him because he kind of insulted their intelligence saying, haven't you read this stuff? And so they says, well, why then, Jesus, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? And Jesus is like, that's not what happened. Moses didn't command you to divorce anybody. Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard, like we discussed. It was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. Um, this is a specifically about divorce because what, that's what the Pharisees asked. Jesus is not giving a full pastoral theology on the, the concept of divorce here. Jesus isn't discussing what happens in an abusive relationship. He's not discussing what happens in a, in a neglecting relationship. He doesn't take into account what Paul says later, that if you're, if you're married to an unbeliever and they decide to leave you, that that divorce is valid. He doesn't get into all that because he's in the middle of a heated debate about this one passage. Does that make sense? So I... Um, there's a f several different thoughts about what makes a divorce valid, um, and I, it's okay. I, like, I, I think there's strong Christians on both sides of the, the thought. One, one saying that, yeah, div sex is the only, outside of marriage is the only thing that dissolves a marriage. Other people would say, um, no, like an abusive relationship or a neglect, those kind of things could constitute divorce. I'm not going to get deeply into that, but I will say that there's some good biblical teaching on both sides of that. Uh, and if anybody wants to talk more, I'm happy to about that. Um, but so what he is saying is that sexual immorality does dissolve that marriage contract which affirms what I was saying, right, about um, the, the boundaries being, needing to be safe and that promise that you make needing to be lifelong because if you go outside of it, you have broken that covenant. And so that marriage could be um, dissolved at that point. All right, that's his teaching on divorce. Um, it was radical to all the people listening. They were like, um, not ready for that. His disciples weren't ready for that. They said, whoa, whoa, whoa. If that's the case, then nobody should get married, right? They said, if this is the situation between a husband and a wife, it's better not to marry. And so if you go to a patriarchal society and you tell them that actually this is about the man and the woman being united together forever, the man in the, in the group are going to like have to have an entire worldview shift to say like, wait, the woman is elevated, like, <laughs> the Bible teaches some amazing things about the beauty of the harmony of the marriage relationship that didn't make sense back to their patriarchal brains. And so they're like, wow, who should ever get married then? And Jesus, interestingly, his reply is so interesting here. He kind of says like, yeah, you're right, it's tough. <laughs> marriage is not for everybody, he says. Not everybody's going to get married. He says, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way. There are eunuchs who have been made by eunuchs by others. And there were those who chose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. So how many awkward things can we talk about in one night? <laughs> he talks about eunuchs three times here, so we got to talk about what does that mean. <laughs> um, back then, kings would have harems, uh, especially way back in the ancient Near East. Kings would have these harems. They would have women as property. Terrible. This is not good, not condoned in the Bible, but um, this is what was happening. And so the king would hire um, men and castrate them um, so that those men would take care of their wives without having any temptation to sleep with their wives. Okay, So um, terrible, like a, a shame on the history of, of humanity, right? But that was common. It was common in Jesus' day, too, that these eunuchs were known. Like, yeah, that, that happens. There's these kings that would do that. They would have eunuchs in there. So what Jesus is saying here is he's using this concept of a eunuch as somebody who would never sleep with, would never have sex and would never be married and would never procreate. That's what a eunuch, that's the function of a eunuch in Jesus' teaching right here. Um, and what he says about them is fascinating. He says, for there are eunuchs that others have made eunuchs, and they're all like, yeah, we know. Like, that happens in the palace. We know about that. So what? 
And then he says there were eunuchs that were born that way, which I think is, probably went right over their heads. And like, it's fascinating to think about what did he mean? And I think he's talking about intersex. And I think he's talking about um, some of the gray lines that we're discovering are part of human sexuality um, that people haven't wanted to talk about for a long time. And he's acknowledging there are people out there that weren't born with the ability to procreate and weren't born with um, the calling to be married. And that's just a fact. That's the fact of life that he says. And he says there were people who have chosen to be eunuchs, who have chosen not to have sex and not to get married and not to procreate for the sake of the, of the kingdom. Do you know who he was talking about then? Himself. <laughs> he was the eunuch who had chose not to have sex, not to get married and not to procreate for the sake of the kingdom and a lot of his followers. Historical fact I just learned today, super interesting. Jesus was the very first religious teacher that we, can ever, that we can find in history that elevated the status of singleness to be a, a healthy and good thing, a state of life. Jesus elevates singleness as something that can be, as a very valid option for a fulfilled life. And then he showed us what it looks like and he remained single his whole life. I want you to hear that because we don't always hear that in the church. I and mean, you don't always hear that from your parents who want grandbabies, that singleness is a valid option. And it really is. It's a valid option for your life. And you can, here's another thing I want you to hear. Sex is not necessary for a fulfilled life. Every TV show you've ever watched will tell you the opposite. Well, maybe not every, if you watch old TV, but in modern TV shows, so many one night stands, right? So much of the plot is like, at what point is the, the sexual tension that's happening at the beginning of the season going to turn into them finally having sex together at the end, right? Every show, cop shows, firefighter shows, dramas, scary shows, every show is like the climax is where finally the two characters that you like end up sleeping together, right? Pretty much. <laughs> so what that's teaching us is that sex is the ultimate goal in life. Um, it's not. It's not the ultimate goal in life. Jesus lived the most fulfilled life, the most interesting life, the most powerful life, the most abundant life, and he never had sex. Something to think about and to own if, if that's where you're at. Um, so we're pretty much done. Okay. <laughs> I'm just going so long, and I'm not apologizing for it. Okay. Um, so I, I hope you have the ideal in your mind. That this is what God created, um, and it's a really beautiful thing. He did it because he loves us. He did it because he cares about us. Um, and um, the, following Jesus is the path to abundant life, right? Come to me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest. There's nothing that you've ever done that's disqualified you from following that rest, from finding that rest, Nothing that's ever been done to you could possibly disqualify you from finding that rest in Jesus. Remember, when he made that invitation, he was talking to the whole crowd, a whole bunch of people with a whole bunch of baggage, with a whole bunch of history, a whole bunch of stories. And he said, come to me, all you weary people, and you will find rest for your whole life. He's promising that to anybody, no matter what you've gone through, no matter what decisions you've made and you're regretting right now, no matter what addiction to porn that you're trying to fight, no matter what... Um, you are struggling, what, whatever pain this could bring up by talking about this, there's nothing that you've done and nothing that could be done to you that could disqualify you from entering into that rest that Jesus is offering. There's so much grace, so much forgiveness, so much moving forward, and he's just inviting us. The only challenge tonight, so there's no shame. I hope there's no shame in the room. Like, I hope you know that if you've done something that you regret, you can just go to Jesus Ask him for forgiveness, and he will forgive you. He is faithful and just to forgive you every time. So I hope you're not feeling shame. If you feel some guilt because you're like, oh, I'm actively in something that I... Then my challenge to you, though, tonight is if your mind has decided to go against Jesus' teaching on this, I just ask you to reconsider because I want you to have an abundant life. If you're set on, like, Jesus is wrong, I don't agree... I would just ask you to reconsider because Jesus made you and he set this all up and he knew what he was doing and it's good. It's so, so good. And so 
if there's something in you that's like, I just don't want to or I can't, I'm not going to follow that, I'd ask you to reconsider. Otherwise, I just hope that I've given you a vision of what the ideal of marriage really is and what the ideal of sex is um, based on this passage in Matthew. I did not say everything I could say or that could be said about sex, but I talked too long already. Um, We've got about 15 minutes to discuss, but um, a couple caveats of the discussions. I purposely made the discussion questions real general, real like 30,000 foot view. I really would rather nobody share personal stories about their sexual history here. I want you to have a find a safe place for that. And if you don't have a safe place for a friend to talk through about stuff like that, but this isn't it because I don't think there's any table where everybody knows and trusts everybody else well enough to um, bear your soul like that. And so healthy boundaries. Um, just I'm asking you not to overshare too many personal vulnerable stories in this discussion time. I think it's super healthy to learn from each other's perspectives, so let's do that, their perspectives on these questions, Um, and I think that would keep it healthy. I am always willing to pray with you guys. I'll be sitting at the couches, eager and willing to pray for anybody that needs some prayer. Have at the discussion. Let's get a little more light.